Welcome back to Mining Now. We have Mass Pro back on the show for part three. So they've already filmed two. Uh, we've had great conversations, and now we've going, we're having uh, Jason Kennard on. He is the director and head of operations at Mass Pro. Jason, welcome to part three. Thank you very much. Um, I was I was joking just before we started filming that uh, you your your three different people from your team got roped in. I, I think Claire uh, recruited everybody. <laughs> I don't even know if everybody knew when when she booked it. I don't think anybody did really, but we'll <laughs> see how we go. Well, I will say I think you're going to be. You've had a couple pretty cool backgrounds, but yours might be. It, it's for sure in the top three. I would say if we took a vote, we might even get a number one there. Uh, where are you sitting right now? So I'm sitting in front of one of our robotic loading machines. Um, it's in the center of our center of excellence here in Condable in New South Wales. Uh, where does that? If you don't mind me asking, where does a machine like that? Where does it originate from? So the actual CNC machine comes from Japan, and then the the robot is actually built in Australia, and mm. parts come from various com- com- countries. Right. Um, so what does it take to put a machine like that into service? I mean, from concept to implementation, identifying that it's the right machine for what you need? Yeah, so a lot of work goes on in, in the background, determining whether, you know, what what parts we need to machine what machine is best suited for those parts and then also looking forward to see what else can we do on that machine you know going forward so there's a lot that goes into it beforehand and then obviously it's an overseas machine so it's a good six to eight months before we even see it mm-hmm. and then there's a week install and then obviously another one to two weeks training before you're actually up and operating when you get a machine like that, when you're, is it, you, you identify the capabilities that you need it to do and then you go to market or what's the, even the process of identifying that that's the right one for you? Yeah. So I guess, well, in, in our instance, you know, we started with on manual machines and then we had one original, very old CNC machine and our products were only increasing. So obviously it's it's about looking at what our product range is and then also, like I said, looking ahead, what is our product range going to be in a couple of years' time and is this machine capable of, in this case, it was probably lasting us maybe three to five years, but we've still got our first machine that we bought and it's been here for, I think it's almost 12 years and still producing those quality parts that the newest machines do. So I guess you'd say in that sense it was a right choice. Yeah, no kidding. Um I'm a couple of the questions I'm asking are probably going to be obvious to you and, and probably to some of the audience, but I'm I'm still going to take a swing at it. Is when you implement machines like this, what what does it allow you to do? And, and what I mean is obviously there's efficiency, you know, um, redistribution of workload, those types of things. Can you just sort of walk us through how it changes once a machine like this comes online in your facility? Yeah, so it, it is a big change, and it's a a big step when you go from not having one of these machines to actually purchasing one and and seeing what it can do. So it obviously opens up a whole new world of opportunities going from, you know, an older machine that can maybe only turn parts and that's all it can do. These machines are multitasking. So they can, what well, they call a turn mill machine. So they can do turning, they can do milling, drilling, tapping. So really you might buy a machine focused on a certain part, but then it opens up that whole opportunity so further part, yeah, customers have further parts that they need made that opens up that whole opportunity. Let's talk about our heavy industry world tour brought to you by Savannah Equipment, supplying mining equipment worldwide. We are heading to events across North America and Australia and filming episodes on location. Email us at info at crownsman.com to be part of Crownsman's heavy industry world tour. Solving the complexities of operational efficiency, safety and compliance, and asset management in mining can be a significant headache. Madison Technologies understands these challenges, and with over three decades of industrial communications experience, they're not just a supplier, but a transformative partner in digitization. Madison Technologies accelerates the digital journey of their clients, and together with global technology vendors, they deliver practical real-world solutions. Visit madison.tech to discover how they can help you unlock future potential with Mining 4.0 Solutions.
Introducing RemScan by Ziltec, the game changer for rapid hydrocarbon soil measurement. Get accurate petroleum hydrocarbon readings in under 30 seconds. No consumables, no wait time. Just scan your sample for on-the-spot results. Perfect for emergency spill response, spill delineation, excavation chasing, and bioremediation monitoring. RemScan is trusted by top industries and backed by independent verifications. Make real-time decisions without the lab wait or expense. Discover more at Ziltech.com or email them at info at Ziltech.com. Remscan by Ziltech, the future of rapid soil assessment. Let's, let's go back. What was the what was the way to do any whatever that machine does? And <laughs> we can actually specify what it does. Um, but whatever that machine does, what was the old way of doing it? The old way of doing it? Uh, of doing whatever that machine, whatever it produces. Um, what w- were you using? Uh, what I'm, I'm assuming it's some sort of hand machine. Um, yeah, so, well, it was a, either a manual lathe or a manual mill. Yeah. And then it'd have to go onto a drill press. It'd have to go onto a linisher, onto a grinder. Whereas basically now you you program this machine, you put the parts in and they come out a finished product. Right. The big delay is that, is it the transporting from one machine to the other? Where is the big savings on a machine like that? Well, the big savings is basically overall on, on every step because you've got the delay from one machine to another, but then also these machines are, have got, you know, the efficiency that you get from a CNC machine compared to a manual machine is second to none. And then also on a manual machine, you've got an operator standing there all day, every day, whereas a CNC machine, once it's set up, it just continuously runs and produces the parts. So, was, was, anybody, so really it's, was anybody scared when those machines came up? They thought that they were... <laughs> They weren't going to have a job or anything like that. I know I'm asking because I know that's not the case. When these machines come in, it just scales up the company, and there's you know plenty of there's more jobs is usually what happens. Um, but what was the feedback from the team? Uh, would probably be a better question uh, when you, these yeah. machines came online. Yeah, so it is. I, I think that's probably a general mindset that when you get into CNC and then obviously automation, robotics, it is a general mindset that you might be doing people out of a job. But the way we look at it is it's a fresh opportunity for mm-hmm. the machinist who was on a machine, then they can work their way up the company because they're no longer required to be on the shop floor or, you know, it, it's really sets up a career path for them. They might've had something in mind and it opens that opportunity for them to really progress in their career. When did these types of machines first start to come on? Like I see that one and it looks like there's another one right behind, maybe like through the back of the building or something right behind you. So you have multiple ones then I'm assuming. Yeah. So in total of actually this one brand, we have 17. 17? 17, yeah. That's spread wow. over Condovalon and then our other manufacturing facility. In oh, okay. Weather Park. Oh, okay. Different locations. I thought you meant just the one location. I was thinking, wow. Oh, here we have... Uh, 13 I believe yeah you have 13 there okay that's that's still a lot um wow so when did the first one come uh it was in initially the very first one was in 2006 but that was a basic CNC machine Mm. and then in 2009 we got our multitasking and we've still got it as I said it's still running today still producing to the high quality that's very good and and then you just keep on on adding. So what does it take when that initial let, let's say the first one that was sort of the level that you're operating with now? What did it take to onboard that to sort of get to a capacity of of what that machine could do? Um, yeah. So I guess initially, you know, obviously it was a completely new beast to us. We hadn't been there before. So initially, it was it took quite a lot of training to get up the speed with it. I was actually trained on the first one that we got. Oh, okay. Um, and then. Yeah, we had, obviously, we, we felt the need that we needed more machinists. So we got in a few more machinists. And so I passed on my training to those guys. And I guess you underestimate what the machine can do. Mm. You're probably feeding it simple parts, doing simple things. But the more you learn, the more you get trained, the more you realize that you want the machine doing the work for you, not you working the machine. Right. Are you now now scaling like a thir- so 13 at one location, hey? Yeah, that's correct. Wow. So are those running, I mean, are those running continuously? Do you run it in shifts? How how do these operate? Yeah, so we do have a night shift team, but it's not the full 13. We have, obviously, during the day, the, the full 13 are running, and then night shift we have, it varies, but anywhere from three to five machines, and then plus the automated work centers as well. 
Hey, mining enthusiasts, registration for CIM Connect 2024 Vancouver from May 12th to 15th is now open. Last year, this convention had over 6,800 participants from 60 countries, with 1,796 delegates, 702 booths, and 320 presentations. Secure your spot and register now at convention.cim.org. CIM Connect 2024, where quality and innovation define the experience. If you're treating refractory gold or complex ores, then you need how to leach difficulty or varying feeds and recover more. It's packed with cases and papers on Albion process leaching technology, but it also has the world's first online calculator. It's free and you'll learn what capex and opex you'll need for Albion process to treat your feed. You need Albion process to liberate your refractory locked gold. To get your pack and use the free calculator, click the link in the description below. So are all these machines, I mean, 13, I'm trying to wrap my head around just the, the capacity you must be putting out. The market demand, or I, I guess the demand for, for MassPro must be massive for that one location. Yeah, it is. It is very big, but there's all, always more opportunities out there. And that's what we're looking to to find. To Ideally, we'd like to have this workshop, all machines running 24-7. That's a that's the end goal. And if we get to that, hopefully we'll increase our number of machines. Uh, Jason, I'd like to have a little bit of an understanding. We've touched on it a bit from the previous two episodes, but I, I think um, I think with your position, uh, you know, head of operations, you'll be able to actually walk us through this in a, in a really good way. It's kind of a two-part question. I'll try to not convolute it too much. Is sort of walk us through the process of, you know, a client has a need and now it goes through your process and out the other end comes the product that they that they need on site. In that process also, though, um, layered on that is keeping the team, the communication, making sure things are delivered on time, making sure everybody's collaborating. And so with those two things happening at once, can you sort of walk us through that process? Yeah, that's a, an interesting subject. So basically, one, once a customer comes to us with a, a need, that's what MassPro is about. We're there to provide a solution for our customers. So that process will initially start with, we'll get a sample product. Um, that'll go through R&D. So that'll be broken down. It'll be scanned. It'll be measured. So that then we can get some drawings from that 3D model. And then the process, then the, the engineers will start determining what materials needed. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. We'll be speaking to metallurgists to ensure that we're getting the, the highest quality material. And then that'll go through into purchasing. The purchasing team will then obviously ensure that that correct material is getting purchased. Once we purchase that material, we'll send a, send a coupon off to our metallurgist. He'll do a thorough inspection of it, ensure that it is of the quality that we've asked for. And then obviously that'll then the drawings are released into the production team and then they go on these high quality CNC machines. They'll produce to the highest quality. Obviously they have their drawing that they go to with all the tolerances. And then once that's machined, it goes through our quality department. So we've got the scan box, which can measure within three micron and then our CMM machine, which can measure within two micron. That's we featured that so, on the first episode, I believe, with Tony, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So quality is always at the forefront of our mind, and that's instilled into our our team. And through that, throughout that whole process, there's always continuous collaboration to ensure that what we first set out to achieve is met within the right lead time or what the customer requires. I don't know how many products you you produce, like how many different types of products are you. Are those thirteen machines? Let's say if they're if they are working, um, are they are they all producing a different product? Um, are you switching products at, like daily, depending depending on client demand? I'm just trying to get a picture of what your or or is, does a client go? Okay, we need a, a hundred of these things because I mean I'm just trying to think of like a machine. There's only so many of one particular part on a mine, so, so it almost seems like you're having to distribute or you having to manufacture all types of parts yeah so we do there's thousands of product lines that we do manufacture and obviously we manufacture the stock because our customers at the mine sites they if they have a breakdown or if they're doing a rebuild or whatever it might be they require those parts mm -hmm. 
most likely it's usually the next day. So right. if we don't have that part in stock, we're going to let our customer down. So we ensure that we're, we're continuously manufacturing to stock. And yeah, as I say, there's never a one same part on, on two machines. It's always different parts. So, so this is not you punching out a uh, hundred of one part then, or, or, or is that, I, I'm also trying to like your own planning. How do you plan out what's going to be manufactured? If, if you know, if someone orders five, um, and maybe they don't, you, you correct me on that. If someone's ordering five, you know, do you, do you make 10 because we're making them all at one time? So we're going to know that in a year they're going to need these next five. Like, how do you sort of manage this as you're, as you're having to switch back and forth? Yeah, so our sales team will work closely with our clients and they'll get a, a yearly forecast. So that mm. forecast, obviously, from all our clients gets put into to one area and that's where we schedule from. So we'll always, obviously, we plan to make to forecast and then if that, that forecast is liquid, so it's always changing. So we're always reviewing that forecast and ensuring that we're not overproducing, but also so we're not underproducing. And the main idea is to ensure that we've got stock on the shelf for the, our customers when they require it. We're, um, where all are you producing from now? So our main manufacturing facility is in Condobla, Central West New South Wales. And then we have a hydraulic manufacturing facility in Wetherill Park in Sydney. And then obviously we've got warehouses strategically placed around Australia. What is, for you, I mean, where did you, you know, you, you, from the start of your career till now, um, just sort of pivoting in, just just to get to know you a little bit before we wrap up the interview. Um, where where was your focus, or or how where has your focus been over the last? How, how long have you been working uh, um, with MassPro? So it's coming up 10. sixteen years. <laughs> no. Sixteen years. Um, sixteen years. Yeah. So. Um, where did, what what was sort of the the lineage? Where did you start, and then sort of getting into this role now? So first, first of all, I had a a little go at sales, which wasn't really my forte. No, I ended up on the shop floor. I was um obviously running a few manual machines. I ended up getting into gear cutting, which was that was very interesting. I really enjoyed that. Um, and then obviously our first CNC machine turned up. I got taught on that, um, and then pass it on to the other machines we had coming in from there i moved into purchasing so that was obviously purchasing all the raw materials and ensuring that that, that i did enjoy that side of it and then there was obviously the more we grew the, the more opportunities were opening up there was a need in production so i started in production planning which went into production management and then obviously the last few years i've now moved up into the head of operations role so i think all that knowledge i've built up mm. you know working through the different areas in the business has really given me what I need to, to take my career the next step. Just out of my own, my own curiosity, because we've had supply chain conversations on this, sh- on the show quite a bit, especially over the last couple of years, um, during, I mean, I know we all want to forget it now, but it's also part of business is during COVID was that, um, and, and is it still spilling over, uh, getting like raw materials and your supply chain that, were you able to maintain that pretty stable? Um, I know mine, I mean, mining cranked right up during that time. So it was a really interesting dynamic between the supply chains, the suppliers, and the operators. Yeah, no, that, that is true. But we, we took it as an opportunity. And we obviously looked ahead and we could see there was going to be potential issues. So our um, procurement team really took it on themselves and we were prepared for that, that downturn in supply coming through. So we looked ahead, we ordered in ahead and we made sure we had enough stock. And, and to be honest, we actually did pretty well through that COVID period. Yeah. So it was hats off to the whole team for working together and preparing for, for the unknown, you might say. Did the company learn anything out of that? Like even how to manage teams, remote work, communication, were there anything that sort of, is it sort of back to normal or, or did, was there things that you went, oh, we can actually implement this long-term. It's a, it's a good long-term strategy for us. Well, I think we did learn a lot. Obviously, one of the main ones was re- working remotely, which we do have quite a few staff working remotely. And, but also the supply chain about, yeah, I guess we, we look at sometimes you just think of a supplier as a supplier, but it's a partnership and it's about being honest and open with them, what your needs are and really looking ahead and, and making sure that you're giving them the forecast so that they're ready to supply what you need. And I think that was probably the biggest learning for us. Yeah. This industry now, um, 
you, the the production just seems uh, what is it like in australia i mean here we've had in canada we've had a little bit of trouble getting new mines off the ground it's been a real challenge um is it similar in australia is a lot of the customer base existing mines that are ramping up production as opposed to new um i know in australia well, i don't know from what i understand is that in australia there's they'll like mines will start off smaller as well they won't go as full scale right off the right off the bat as we'll do here um is there opportunities in there for you yeah yeah there definitely is like obviously as you said there's a lot of existing mines that are still ramping up you know new developments within that existing mine but there is always those those smaller mine sites that are opening up mm -hmm. and within that obviously they do start off smaller but it doesn't matter how big or small the customer is there's always plenty of opportunity there to and i guess it's about MassPro giving them the solutions to help them move ahead quicker yeah are there a fair amount of new mines that come online i i'm just genuinely asking i i just i'm not you know i haven't even been to australia so i'm i'm just trying to get sort of the lay of the land a little bit yeah well there's there's there is quite a few starting and there's a lot in the pipeline mm. so th there's plenty of opportunity there but I guess it just depends how rich you know, it is where, where they're mining and what's the opportunity for them as well. So obviously they've got to do all their exploration and ensure that it's going to be sustainable. Just from this operations plan um, and going back to the things you've learned, now is it is the company at a point where that demand, um, I mean, we've done multiple episodes. It's, it's obviously that you have some clear competitive advantages in the market. Um, are you at a point now you can pretty much meet the demand as it comes uh, within the places you serve? Yeah, we are. We're very flexible. But I think right now we're ready to to take on whatever comes our way. We're, we've got this center of excellence here in Condobolin and obviously our hydraulic cylinder manufacturing facility in, in Wetherill Park. And we're really, we've set that platform to go to the next level. Um, you mentioned that center of excellence and I, and I heard about it before, I believe. Um, can you expand a little bit about what that is for MassPro? Yeah, so for MassPro, that, that our center of excellence in Condoval, and it's our manufacturing facility and it's we hold it at our highest standard. It's always nice and clean and it's somewhere where we want to bring our customers and our suppliers to see how what, everything that goes on and why they receive mm -hmm. the highest quality part from MassPro. It it says something about a company that, that you know we've done two episodes now with you actually sitting in your facility, and um, I mean we have tons of great people that come on the show. Not everybody goes and sits in their facility. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> um, so it says something right away when a company wants people to come in. They want them to take a look. What are you What are you the most proud of? Um, over you know sixteen. You, you've been working with the company sixteen years. You said. All my 16 years. Yep. Yeah, that's that's a long time to work for, for you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's family or that's still a long time to dedicate yourself to a company. Um, wh what are you the most proud of that you've you've accomplished within that, that time frame? I guess I'm the most proud of the team that I've built up underneath me. Mm -hmm. Obviously, within Maspro, it's not one single person that's running the business. It's all teamwork. And the more we empower our team to achieve that, goal the overall arching goal yeah you can see the efforts and and you can see the results it's that i guess that would be my proudest moment what what was uh out of out of all your uh, uh, i keep promising people I, i'm gonna be the last question i just keep asking questions um <laughs> but but over your career what what has been something that that challenged you um you went okay well you said you didn't like sales we won't count something you don't just like that that's no fun but you know something that you did enjoy it, but it was a challenge, um, sort of getting to the level where you felt you were delivering. Yeah, I think taking the step from production management into the operations role. Obviously, production management is only one area mm -hmm. where operations covers a, a vast array of areas within the business. So there's a lot to learn. I've learned a lot, still a lot to learn, but that probably was my biggest challenge. But without a challenge, where do you get in life? Well, yeah, it gets, uh, I, I, I actually did a personality test just like, <laughs> I think it was yesterday actually. And, uh, it, it very clearly told me it was, it's supposed to be a quite actually a good, like Carl Jung, it's, it's actually supposed to be quite good. Um, and it was, uh, basically I always need a new challenge. <laughs> I went, well, I already knew that, but, but, uh, yeah, no, it is fun. It is fun to always, you know, and, and, and he, you know, we get Mass Pro on and learning. I'm always happy when we do these 
these multi episode ones because you see this company that you see one type of company that goes, we're really good. We just don't want to push. We don't want to sort of take risks. And it just, it's hard to get excited about it. But a company like this, I get to do these interviews and see this company that's pushing, you know, everybody we're ta- everybody we talk to from your company, they want more, they want to grow, they want to do better. Um, it's kind of hard not to get inspired by that. So uh, I do appreciate you taking the time and just your whole team for working with us to make these episodes. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, that's been another episode of Mining Now. We will put, uh, of course, links uh, for for you to follow Mass Pro and go onto their website and everything like that. Um, but we'll also put links to the other episodes that we've done with them. So if you're seeing this, just open up the link. You'll probably see it right there. You'll be able to go watch those episodes. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Make sure to take a moment to subscribe. We love the support we've been getting and and love the support we've been getting from Australia doing these episodes. It's been amazing. Thank you to Gaudi on-site traveling all over Australia filming these for us. Thank you to the rest of the team and uh, Mubarak here filming in the house. And we will see you on the next episode of Mining Now.